Good evening. It is my privilege to welcome you to the 26th Washita Hills Christmas program. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us this evening. My name is Jonathan and this is Bethany. At Christmas time, we recount the birth of Christ and well it is that we should do so. We are told, although we do not know the exact day of Christ's birth, we would honor the sacred advent. May the Lord forbid that anyone should be so narrow-minded as to overlook the event, because there is an uncertainty in regard to the exact time. Let us teach how Jesus came into the world to bring hope, comfort, peace, and happiness to all. We wish to do this this evening. During this very special and sacred program, we want nothing more than for God to be glorified as we praise him for the gift of his son. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. I pray that you would be with us tonight. I pray that all that we do will be for your glory and honor. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Ever since the fall of mankind from his innocence in Eden, the heart cry of humanity has been for a redeemer, for Emmanuel. What a depth of meaning is found in that name, Emmanuel, God with us. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. Scripture declares that he was the very image of God, the full expression of God's glory. To show this glory, to reveal the light of God's love, Jesus was to come to our sin-darkened earth. Jesus could have remained in heaven. He could have kept for himself the glory of heaven. But he chose to step down from the throne of the universe in order to answer this cry. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a voice was heard in heaven. A body you have prepared for me. Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Christ, the living word, was about to visit our world. The word was to be made flesh and dwell among us. If he had appeared with the glory that was his before the world was created, we could not have endured the light of his presence. In order that we could behold it and not be destroyed, his, he shrouded his glory and veiled his divinity with humanity. When the great clock of time reached the appointed hour and the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has come to thee, O Israel.
the babe of Bethlehem, though the king of glory, was not entrusted to wealthy parents. His was a lowly lot. In fact, when presented to be dedicated in the temple on the eighth day after his birth, his parents could not offer anything but the offering of the poorest class, a pair of turtle doves. And yet no sooner had the prophet Simeon seen the infant in the priest's arms than he was divinely impressed. Taking him in his own arms, he blessed him and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. <clears throat> Simeon realized that he held in his arms one who was the way, the truth, and the life. There was nothing at this time in Christ's outward appearance to give him this assurance, but Simeon had lived in the atmosphere of heaven. The bright beams of the Son of Righteousness gave him spiritual discernment, and Simeon was prepared for the revelation of the great truth that this helpless infant was the Lord's anointed, even the Messiah. Joy and exultation transfigured his face as he held in his arms God's most precious gift to men. He saw that Christ was to be the hope of the Gentiles, as well as the glory of thy people Israel. Jesus, the Messiah, was to br bring redemption to all. Will we too recognize him tonight as did Simeon? Let us turn our hearts toward him as we recount his birth. Please join the orchestra, bells, and choir as we sing together, O Come All Ye Faithful. The words are in your program. God with us. It was the greatest news in history. God had come in the flesh. With rapt attention, the entire universe was focused on this event. But with mankind, the story was different. Men had been blinded by sin and did not know the time of his visitation. 
the earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the sun of righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. Mountains in reply, echoing the brave delight. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why these songs of happy cheer? What great brightness did you see? What glad tidings did you hear?
One of the most recognized and thrilling parts of the Christmas story is the appearance of the angels to the humble shepherds on the hills of Bethlehem. Bursting with exuberance, the angelic multitude came to announce the greatest event in human history. The long prophesied Messiah had been born at last. Never have human ears heard such a song. Never have human eyes beheld such a sight. With irrepressible joy, they came to share the greatest news ever given to mankind. The Son of Righteousness had come with healing in his wings. Filling the sky from east to west and echoing from hill to vale, the vast angelic choir peels forth their majestic chorus to poor shepherds who were the only people whose hearts were humble and open enough to receive the good news. Glory to God in the highest and on earth Peace, goodwill to men. the children to come up here. We have a special section just for children now in our program. And uh, if you can come up here and have a seat, we have a special story for you. You can come right up here and have a seat on the stage. can sit right around here. This is Uncle Rob's story time, and I need some kids to come up here and have a seat for a special story. You can sit right over here, squeeze, sco scoot on around right over here so that they can see too. You all can scoot on around over here. Some of you can come up here and sit right there. Come on around on, on this side so they can, so the audience can see you too. If you can scoot on around this way a little bit. All right. Do you all like bells? Christmas is full of good music. I think there's been more good music written at Christmas time than perhaps any other time of the year. And bells are lots of pretty. Does it look like fun? You're going to get a chance to play um, the bells here in just a moment. But before you do, 
I have a story for you. Now, some stories are happy, and some stories are kind of sad. And this story is a little bit sad, but it teaches a very profound lesson. At Christmas time, we usually think about a lot of happy things, but you know, sometimes the Christmas season gets so busy that we forget about the most important thing about what Christmas is all about. Well, this story comes from back in the year 1944. And if you know anything about history, there was something going on in the world at that time that was incredibly profound. Anyone know what was going on in 1944? It was one of the major wars that we had in, America, in world history. World War II was going on, and this story comes from Italy, just south of the Appian Mountain Range, if I pronounce that correctly, in uh, the northern part of Italy. And it was a train, a train that was a cargo train that doesn't carry passengers. It only carries cargo as it journeys. Uh, in, in the wartime, they carried lots of different things. They, they carried lots of different things, and they um, didn't carry passengers. But during the war, there were few trains, and so whenever a train left, it often carried passengers. And as this train left um, its station there, it, it, it didn't have too many passengers on it, but when it stopped at the next station, it picked up some passengers, and when it stopped at the next station, it picked up some more passengers, and when it stopped at the next station, what do you think it did? It picked up some more passengers, and pretty soon, there were over 650 people on this cargo train that wasn't meant to carry anyone. Soldiers coming back from the front, going home. And they started, now in that part of Italy, there's a lot of mountains. The Alps are there and the mountains are there. And so I've been through there and there are a lot of tunnels that go through that part of Italy. There's tunnels. There's one of the train rides that has more tunnels on it than anywhere else on earth. And this train left the Salerno station in northern Italy there and was headed to the Ami um, Tunnel. Now, the Ami Tunnel is a tunnel that goes up. And as it goes an incline all the way through the mountain, it goes up because it comes out on the other side at a higher elevation than it did where it went in. And this train, now loaded with over 600 people plus all the, all the cargo, started going into the Ami Tunnel soon after it left the Salerno station there. And it was going up. Now, it had two locomotives. They were old steam locomotives, and they carried coal. Now, during wartime Italy, though, there wasn't very much good quality coal that was available, and so the only coal that they had was of a poor quality, and that's, those engines were chugging away, trying to pull this load up the incline inside that tunnel. And as they got into that tunnel, about partway in, almost entirely in, in fact, one of the engines stalled. It stalled out. It couldn't make the incline. And it sat in that tunnel for 30 minutes. With both engines going full steam, but the train didn't go anywhere. Now, that was a dangerous situation to be in. Because you know what happens when... Trains pour out smoke. They pour out something called carbon monoxide that is poisonous. And there were over 500 people who never came out of that tunnel. But the sad part about it was when they discovered afterwards, they discovered that the front locomotive had his engine in full forward, trying to go forward. And the back locomotive, what do you think he had his engine in? He had it in reverse, trying to get out of there. And they sat there for 30 minutes, one trying to go forward, the other trying to go backwards. And where did they go? Nowhere. That was one of the worst 
train disasters in history. And a sad one, but it teaches a profound lesson. What were those two locomotives doing? One trying to go forward, one trying to go backwards. Well, one was an Austra Austrian locomotive, the other was an Italian, and one was a left-handed uh, one, and the other was a right-handed one, and they couldn't communicate. And because of that, they had one of the worst disasters in history. You know, at Christmas time, we talk about a lot of G about Jesus and his birth, but the world sometimes talks about so many other things, and it seems like one's going forward and one's trying to go backwards in this Christmas season oftentimes. One headed in one direction and the other in the other. And what often happens? We in the middle don't go anywhere. We need to make sure that we have a, an engineer on board that knows which way to go and is going what? Forward. And we have Christ on board that our train that is going forward and doesn't contradict with somebody trying to go backwards. And that is a lesson that we need to learn. Make sure that you have an engineer that knows where they're going and is going forward. And then you can have a fun and a good train ride. Do you want to have a train ride? Would you like to? Yeah. Would you like to have a train ride tonight that is going forward, that has Jesus at the center of the Christmas season and that is going forward? Would you like to? All right. All aboard. All aboard! <laughs> Do you enjoy that train ride? That's a train going forward, all right? <laughs> Make sure your Christmas season is going forward with Jesus. All right, come on up here and come to one of the students, and they're going to let you play a song here in the program. Come right on up. Come around to one of them. Some of you can go around to the back side. You have to kind of go around the tables on that side and the tables on that side, and uh, they'll help you out, get suited up. You didn't know you can join a bell choir and play in here, but I think if you go cooperate with one of them, You'll be surprised. There's some room on the back there. You can go right around this side. Come on right around over here, and you can uh, come to one of them. There's some people on the back over there that don't have anybody. And squeeze through or go around. There we go. Um, yeah. All right. This is an exercise in cooperation to see if we can go forward together. Now, children, don't, you have to cooperate. Don't go one direction and someone else go the other. All right, let's see if we can make a joyful, uh, merry heart here.
We marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the manger and the companionship of adoring angels for the beast of the stall. Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence. Yet this was but the beginning of his wonderful condescension. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence and in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. He came with such a heredity as we have to share our sorrows and temptations, to give us the example of a sinless life, and give his life a ransom for many. Sing, O ye heavens, shout for joy, O ye earth, for the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Israel. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born upon this day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father a blessed angel came. And unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Now to the Lord sing praises, will you within this place? And with true love with and brotherhood of each other now embrace this holy tide of Christmas all other doth efface. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O oh, and joy. God commanded Moses for Israel, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And he abode in the sanctuary in the midst of his people. Through all their weary wandering in the desert, the symbol of his presence was with them. So Christ set up his tabernacle in the midst of our human encampment. He pitched his tent by the side of the tents of men that he might dwell among us and make us familiar with his divine character and life. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials and sympathizes with our griefs. Every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our Creator is the friend of sinners. For in every doctrine of grace, every promise of joy, every deed of love, every divine attraction presented in the Savior's life on earth, we see God with us.
be that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. These men were not Jews, but they had been waiting for the predicted Messiah. They had studied prophecy and knew that the time was at hand when Christ would come. And they were anxiously watching for some sign of this great event that they might be among the first to welcome the infant heavenly king. These wise men were philosophers and had studied the works of God in nature. In the wonders of the heavens, in the glories of the sun, moon, and stars, they traced the finger of God. They were not idolaters. They lived up to the dim light which shone upon them, and God rewarded their faith and their search. Unto them was given a revelation such as none other in the history of the world. Himself said, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. It was simply because the wise men sought with honest hearts that they found. The scripture does not record one example of a single person who sought but found not. God ever reveals himself to the humble seeker for light. His promise is sure. Ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all of your heart. We may come to Jesus with our burdens and perplexities, and know that he will respect our appeals to him, because he has promised to hear. The question is, are we truly seeking? Are we searching with all of our hearts? If so, we too 
may find Emmanuel, God with us. God collected all the riches of the universe and gave them all into the hands of Christ, saying, all these are for man. Use these gifts to convince him that there is no love greater than mine in earth or heaven. His greatest happiness will be found in loving me. Oh, that today the human family could recognize that gift. Emmanuel, God with us. This means everything to us. What a broad foundation does it lay for our faith. What a hope big with immortality does it place before the believing soul. God with us in Christ Jesus to accompany us every step of the journey to heaven. The Holy Spirit with us as a comforter, a guide in our perplexities to soothe our sorrows and shield us in temptation. This is what we sing about at Christmas.
Christianity is still as much the object of heaven's solicitude as when common men of common occupations met angels on the hills of Bethlehem, and a star directed the Magi to Bethlehem. The nativity is not just an event in the past. The one who came 2,000 years ago comes to each heart today. The Emmanuel of Bethlehem is still God with us today. Christ came to teach the grand truth so needful for us to learn, that God is always with us, an inmate of every dwelling, that he is acquainted with every action performed on earth. He knows the thoughts that are framed in the mind and are endorsed by the soul. He hears every word that falls from the lips of human beings. He is walking and working in the midst of all our transactions in life. He knows every plan and he measures every method. The Christ who came as a baby is standing at the door of our hearts tonight as a savior and a king asking, is there room for me? Or are the streets too crowded and rooms overstuffed and the quiet moments filled with activity so that there is still no room for him today? Jesus promises to be God with us if we allow him. Let us receive him into our hearts tonight. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your son. As a ransom for our sins, I pray that during this Christmas season, we would remember why we celebrate Christmas and not get caught up in the hustle and bustle. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>